Welcome to the Humble Hoof Podcast. My name is Alicia Harlov. This is a podcast for both horse owners and hoof care professionals, offering discussions into various philosophies on the health of the hoof and soundness of your horse. Please check us out on Facebook or at thehumblehoof.com. I first found Krista Jones when I was rehabbing my navicular horse. For more on his story, see episode 16 called Case Study Number 1. Krista had a horse named Buddy that had been rehabbed from a navicular diagnosis after going to Rockley Farm Rehab in England. This started Krista on a journey to basically change her entire life and begin a career helping to rehab horses through equine bodywork, and she's even opening her own rehabilitation facility in the UK. She was so incredibly helpful and supportive during my own horse's rehab, and I knew she would have a lot to say about getting horses on the right path to soundness. What that ended up evolving into is an episode about using movement analysis and dynamic balance to set a horse up for success. So to get started, uh, I know this story because I've followed you for a few years, but how did you get into rehabbing horses? Um, So as my website says, it all began with Buddy. So I had a warm blood. He was six years old. He was starting to show some Well, we thought it was bridal lameness, but when we actually did the workup, he was lame. So he was diagnosed with navicular pedalostitis and we assumed soft tissue damage, but we didn't do an MRI because, you know, with the bone damage pretty evident on x-ray, my vet said, you know, don't waste the money on an MRI, you're better off spending that on treatment. So we presumed collateral ligament damage and DDFT damage as well. So... We tried, you know, all the traditional stuff. I tried those beautiful egg bar wedges, which now make me shudder when I watch those videos back. (laughs) Um, We did steroid injections and everything. But it was quite evident to me quite quickly that he wasn't getting better. And unfortunately for me, I'd lost my previous horse because he'd had a massive tear to his DDFT. So I knew that if things didn't work quickly, the likelihood is they weren't going to work at all. So I made the decision, I'd done some research and found Rockley Farm and decided to send him there. So yeah, that's where it all started. So I had, that was gone eight years ago now, if you can believe it, but he's been sound ever since. Um, He's semi-retired now, but that's because he's got an issue with his nuchal ligament. So he can't do the lateral flexing that he used to do. So he was schooling at medium level um, dressage in the UK. But, you know, we did everything together. He evented, he hunted, he did dressage, we did, you know, hacking, pleasure rides, you name it. We did it together. So it was a real eye-opening experience for me. And Because I started, you know, I started my Facebook page and my blog and back then Barefoot was still, I think it still is a bit of a dark art to be honest, but Mm -hmm. even, even more so then. So I got a lot of people getting in touch with me and I developed, you know, people had always messaged me for questions and I was so enthusiastic about it that I wanted to just learn more and more kind of similar to you you know when you go through that rehab journey and you feel and you see all the differences and you then see these other horses moving in a way that you just know is detrimental to them that just drove my knowledge to be better and do better and try and help them really yeah and so you eventually changed your your whole career right because of him Well, I'm in the process of changing. So, but yes, I've retrained. So I'm a equine rehabilitation sports massage therapist now. Um, But I did that because of Buddy, because he's so tricky. He hates other people touching him. But I've always had this dream in the back of my mind of setting up the rehab facility at home. And we moved here almost three years ago. So it's slowly coming into fruition. But yeah, I'm hoping by next year, the rehab track will be up and running and it will fall in line with the sports massage business that I'm doing as well. That's great. So with your bodywork business, when you come up to a client or a horse that an owner has had issues with, where do you start when you're going to do an assessment or evaluation? Um, So I obviously ask the owners loads of different questions, but the reality is 
and I think we're all guilty of it. When we're looking at our own horses, you become blind to certain things. So I'll ask if there are any performance issues that they're seeing or feeling, but I just get them moving. So all I need to see really is them walking away from me and towards me, and then I spin them in a tight circle. So I'm just checking what their baseline is at that point. And horses give away quite a lot, and I can tell... You know, I've developed quite a good eye over time and I can see what issues riders will be having under saddle and also, you know, compensation that they are putting through their body because of the way that they're moving. And you don't have to see them on the lunge to be able to do that. It's literally just walking away from you. It's, it becomes pretty obvious. So when I'm looking at a horse move, I always just kind of stare at their feet because that's where I'm so focused. But where are you looking everywhere in the body, kind of the different muscling and how it's moving and and where, where are you looking specifically? Yeah, I mean, for me, I'm the first thing I look for is any form of one sidedness. So if one muscle group is more overdeveloped or underdeveloped any reduced rib swing so the ribs actually move quite a lot when when the back muscles are soft and relaxed you get a really good lateral swing through that rib cage and very often horses will show a one-sidedness through that so they'll have a swing maybe to the left but it'll be reduced on the right so that's something to look for how their head and neck are moving again you know if they're having a head tilt or they're holding their neck to one side or the other that's usually compensating for either a stiffness or even potentially a lameness elsewhere but yeah i mean for me it's i'm looking for everything load bearing to be as even as possible and that does the whole body all the way you know we're called from the ground up for a reason because it normally starts at the foot and goes up (laughs) yeah actually as you were talking i was wondering that is there a way that you can tell if it's you know, definitely coming from a hoof issue or lameness, or if it's something higher up, or is it kind of, you know, you don't really know until you start working on the horse? It can be really difficult. I mean, obviously I've grown to look at feet obsessively (laughs) over time. So I will always look at the feet. I can't help it. It's the first thing I look at. And I'm obviously not there to advise them on, you know, their shoeing or, you know, barefoot regime that's not that's not what I'm usually there for but I will see how that foot is placing itself and you know if there are you know some of the horses that I work on are top end competition horses so I've got some you know four star eventers and some Grand Prix dressage horses on my books and I see the way that they're moving their feet I can tell that there will be a problem elsewhere but it's sometimes hard to tell whether the foot is causing that issue or it's a body issue causing that issue if that makes sense yeah right and do you see you know kind of offshoot of that do you see confirmation play a role in their movement and biomechanics or is it usually a compensation of of muscling or pain it it really depends on the horse i mean you know it's it's like people some of us are confirmationally better off but that doesn't mean that you move in the right way because there are so many different factors that can affect biomechanics and that doesn't just have to be you know standing statically a horse can look like it's got the best confirmation in the world but the moment it takes that first step it could be hypermobile in which case you know it's it's got no real superficial control of those the muscles you have to you know hypermobility so some of the dressage horses that I work with are hypermobile and their owners think that it's a great thing but actually I'm hypermobile myself so I have increased mobility through my spine and my hips and everyone thinks that's great when I was a kid I could do the splits and everything but the problem is that you actually use your joints and your bones to move rather than activating your muscles to move the bones which may sound a bit of an odd thing to say but that's the way it works so with people I can obviously start and say okay right I need to lift something or engage you know lift my leg I have to actively think about engaging those muscles and I had to go through a training program you know to learn how to activate those deep muscles which was crazy but for horses that becomes really tricky so if you have a hypermobile horse and you're not asking it and you're not activating 
those muscles, particularly in the hind limbs, then you can end up with all sorts of degeneration and osteoarthritis type issues later down the line. And so how would you begin to to start to teach a horse to activate those muscles? Is that in like a training program or is body work a part of that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a training program, but I'm, I like to think of a whole horse regime. I mean, spending 20 minutes doing pole work, which is great, you know, that's fine in a small part of your training program. But I like to encourage my owners as much as possible to think of a whole horse approach and think of this as kind of day-to-day stuff that you can try and ask them to think a bit more about what they're doing. So proprioception, obviously, we talk about that all the time that's so important and again there is a big difference and i see it a lot between the shod horses and the barefoot horses on my program the horses that are shod really struggle with understanding where their feet are and particularly the hypermobile ones because they've got issues with the extra weight on the bottom of their feet which people don't think about so much when you know we're talking about barefoot horses versus shod horses but the flight of the limb is massively affected by having a weight effectively at the bottom of the foot. So you have to take that into consideration and asking them to think about where their feet are being placed. I mean, I've got owners to throw, you know, poles and sticks and logs in the fields when they're out, if they're not on a track system and you can't, you know, take advantage of that. But even the walk to the field, asking them to step over things, you know, move things, going backwards, making sure, you know, taking a few steps backwards up a hill, make sure that they're activating those muscles, particularly the, in the hindquarters, and, you know, not just using their bones to move. Yeah, that's those are some really good ideas. I'm actually thinking about what I can do with my own barn. <laughs> um, <laughs> so as you're, you know, watching the horses move, is there any way or any um, anything you can tell owners of like that they can look for even if they don't have a super trained eye in terms of whole body movement. Um, I know I usually tell owners to look for, you know, a heel first landing that's landing, you know, balanced on both heels. Um, yeah. Is there anything that you can add on top of that? That might be easier for, I know that you mentioned the rib cage, um, but something we can watch for either down the limb or any warning signs of, you know, the horse might not be using its body correctly. Yeah, there's quite a few, actually. And I think that one-sidedness, most owners can feel it, you know, particularly in a ridden horse. Horses are usually better on one rein or the other. So that is an indicator that they are compensating already because they're stronger one side than the other. And that is a natural thing. We do that in exactly the same way. So that's fine to an extent. But if you're starting to see overdeveloped muscles, and this is really easy for owners to look at. So I get mine to all stand on a mounting block and look down at their horses without any tack on. And you can look at the shoulders. They're normally a good indicator for any front limb issues. Um, and again, the hind limbs. And and as you know already, but if for your listeners, if there are issues in one leg, they will show in the diagonal opposite and normally the other weight-bearing foot. So if you've got issues in your left front foot, you'll see those in the right front foot and usually the right hind as well. So that's just little things to look out for. Saddle fit is also an indicator if things aren't right. So any form of slipping, but usually side to side slipping can indicate that there is a problem with the movement, especially if that's not new. And if you can't see any kind of muscles that have overdeveloped, so if you've got one bigger shoulder than the other, of course, that's going to make your saddle slip. But If the muscles look even, but you are feeling that the saddle is slipping one way or the other, then that's normally indicative of potentially hind limb issues. So again, something to bear in mind. Toe dragging can be seen in, you know, wearing the feet unevenly. If they're shod, you'll see it in the shoes. Um, I ask all of my clients to speak to their farriers and their, you know, any hoof care professional talk them through what the wear is like on their horse's feet because they need to understand as well. You know, I think that's probably my number one thing that I ask all of my owners is get involved, understand what your horse's normal is. So then if you see anything, like if your horse is squaring his toe off, you know that you need to do something about it rather than that just being their normal. Other things, I suppose, a random one is reluctance to load or if they start traveling badly, 
that's a huge, huge red flag for any feet issues or back issues. So actually, if I'd have known this before, Buddy started refusing to load about nine months before we got the diagnosis. So if I'd have known that, I could have started investigating, but I didn't. <laughs> right. Yeah, I know. I mean, all of us are have kind of learned trial by fire, which makes it hard to, you know, there's so many times I wish I could go back and, and have seen things that I know now, you know, and, and tried things earlier, but you know, we were on this path to learn and <laughs> it definitely has well, taught us exactly. a lot, right? <laughs> Exactly. These horses are here to, you know, educate us. And I can tell you what, I've learned a hell of a lot since Buddy's been in my life. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I think those are all really great. I mean, they're things that I'll definitely start looking for too. So, you know, say you have these issues that are coming up or as an owner and owners noticing these things, how do you best incorporate body work? Is there, is, I mean, I'm sure it's different for every horse, but do you have them on a certain schedule? I assume it's not like a one-time thing, you know? No, no. I normally, for horses that are in full work, and I, when I say full work, I mean some form of competitive type regular riding, um, they're normally on a four to eight week schedule, depending on the horse and depending on what they're doing. For the dressage horses, usually actually that's a smaller, I normally do them every month or, you know, four weeks because their bodies are actually under a far greater strain and they tend to not cross train as much. So with the eventers and the jumpers, they tend to do a bit of hacking and a bit more fitness work. So that takes a little bit of pressure off the body. But, you know, some of the dressage horses are schooling 90% of the time. So that puts a, a lot of strain on their body. And what do you see the the hooves improve as you have them on like a body work schedule and, and you know, maintenance body work over and over? Do you see changes in the feet? Yeah, yeah, a lot. And those changes, particularly, not so much in a short horse, but if we're talking about bare feet, yes, inc they are incredibly dynamic. And they change very, very quickly. And it's really interesting to see how different horses respond in different ways. And I mean, I've seen it with all of mine, I treat all of mine, not as often as I probably would like, but I see it, if they've got tight spots, I can see it in their feet that they will change a little bit they may grow a little bit of flair or you know it's it's fascinating watching the feet change as they grow and again if their movement is changing then the feet will change as well so particularly for the horses that are on the rehab programs you see them you know usually their toe first or at least kind of flat to toe and their whole body is rigid where they're landing and all of that concussion is going up the leg and being dispersed around the body normally you see it in their shoulders and in their neck particularly for horses that have been landing like that for a while for the smarter ones you see that they're starting to compensate behind so they'll get kind of lumbar pain so kind of at the back of the saddle and also their hamstrings will be incredibly tight where they're trying to shift their weight backwards like a like a laminitic you know you see that with horses like that and they're trying to shift and change their weight so it's a very fine line with these horses that are rehabbing between releasing that tension off too quick it's very tricky because they've they're moving like that for a reason there's a problem so they need to move better to be able to land better but it's understanding where that pain is coming from and why and then releasing it off slowly. So it's like how, you know, you use self-trimming or, you know, you don't trim aggressively. If a horse is landing toe first, you're not going to dump the toe off to make it land on its heels. You want to help it build up that strength gradually over time. So that's the process I take when I'm dealing with a horse that's rehabbing. There's no point in releasing everything off altogether because it's protecting itself and you, you could do more damage you know long term by you know not working within the bounds of that horse's comfort right yeah definitely so something that I see a lot with clients that I whenever I see it I always tell them to have a body worker come out and assess one is negative 
plantar angles or, you know, negative palmar angles. But usually yeah. with the hinds, I usually say, okay, if these are really negative behind, I think there's probably an issue higher up in the body. Yeah. Do you have any insight with negative angles and and if body work can help those or have you seen it change those? With negative angles, yes, I have. So again, you're quite right in the fact that the muscles that are higher up will have an impact on the tendons and ligaments below it particularly in the hind legs because i don't i don't know if many people know but it, the lower legs are literally just tendons and ligaments there is no serious muscle on the lower leg so the only it kind of ends at the knee essentially any form of muscle so all of that action has to be taken higher up so yeah with the with those negative angles it's very often a lumbosacral issue anything kind of at the top of the pelvis back of the saddle you will get all of those muscle groups are huge and they can pull limbs out of shape and i've seen it you know with the way that horses are moving very often you know how you see some horses will hitch and you think oh that's a bit that's lame no it's just that those muscles the glutes and around the lumbosacral region are incredibly tight and so they have to hitch to move forward in some form of you know reasonable way Yeah, that makes sense. I know. I was just thinking about, so do you think it's advantageous then to have an owner that's worried that their horse is a little bit hitchy or a little bit like not quite right um, to have a body worker come out and and assess before doing more invasive diagnostics? I mean, I think it depends a lot on the situation and the owners. I mean, in the UK, I don't know what the situation is globally, but in the UK, I can only work under vet permission anyway. So I have to get veterinary permission to be able to work on any horse. So I would always have that conversation and if an owner calls me and says look and in fact I've, I've got a client who I was treating recently the horse had has a history of suspensory issues and had some hock issues also but was moving in a really odd way so the owner was freaked out thinking it had done its suspensory again so I, I asked them to call their vet and just check that the vet was okay but in this situation yeah the body work was what was needed so I personally will work on a lame horse as long as it's not, you know, crippled lame. If there's something that's, you know, one, two tenths lame, I will work on it because I think very often in those cases, it can be something muscular that's affecting the way that the horse is moving. And even if I can't fix that lameness or that offness, I can usually feel where the body is compensating. So then at least you get some kind of markers as to where to start looking but because i'm looking at the whole horse you know my client's case actually i said to them i don't think there's actually anything wrong with your horse can we have a look at the saddle because what they were describing to me was that the saddle was too tight and actually yes that was that ended up being the cause of the problem so you know it is a whole horse approach and we do need to work as a team to kind of tickle these boxes and find the root cause but yeah i'm a fan of putting your hands on your horse and finding out where those issues are coming from before you take the next step. A lot of Buddy's rehab involved getting his feet stronger through proper movement, and Rockley utilizes a track system to do that. Track systems are an alternative turnout option where horses have pathways made with fencing or natural barriers to get from one food source to another or from a food source to water, for example. This can force them to move over various terrain in any way that they feel comfortable doing so. If they can do this without being pushed from us, often their feet get stronger, their muscling improves, and the horse is more sound. Right, yeah. And I know that you talked a little bit in the beginning about how you're hoping to make your facility a track system rehab, or you're you're almost there. And... So I, I would love to talk a little bit about track systems, you know, what they are and what benefits you've seen in the body and the feet, if you're, if you're willing to talk about it that a little bit. Oh, I love it. I love my track. It's probably the best thing for my horses that I have ever done. It's funny because my, the property that we bought in the UK property is ridiculous. And particularly if you put anything equestrian in the front of it, the prices go sky high. So I never thought I'd be in a position to have my own place. But where we are... Half of it is woodland and half of it is kind of traditional paddock. So for me, it made sense. I was like, yes, I can have my beautiful track going through the woods and it'll be amazing. Um, So that's what we've got. The majority of the track runs through the woodland here. And then we use the paddocks as almost, 
not quite an equicentral type system but almost um because i don't actually allow my horses on the grass in the winter they only get access during the summer you know and that's only through the evenings but yeah i mean the tracks even a small track that i have in the winter has improved the horse's musculature beyond doubt i mean all of my horses look incredible bella my dressage mare was off over the winter she got steroid induced laminitis in november so she was on you know reduced movement obviously we had to be really careful with her but she actually packed on more top line in the eight weeks that she was on kind of track rest than i could believe i had to get her saddle you know checked and that had gone up two wicks when i started riding her again so the evidence is there my four-year-old people think she's in work you know her musculature and top line is incredible she looks like she's in decent work and she's not even back yet but yeah it's it's honestly the best thing I've done for my horses I think and are they on it 24 7 are they you know is it that their permanent turnout so I mix it up a bit so in the winter they're in overnight and then out in the daytime and then I try and keep them out as much as possible when the weather gets better. Last winter, I only had part of my track surfaced, but by the time this winter comes around, half of it will be all done. So they'll have a much bigger space. So my plan is to keep them on the overnight turnout schedule. And to be fair, the only reason I changed it this year was because Bella got laminitis. So I needed to change how I was managing the horses because of that, because she obviously needed to spend some time, you know, on the yard and, not being chased around by the four-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> and do you do, do you have obstacles on the track or, you know, various surfaces or I know that you, it's naturally on a, um, through the woods anyway, right? You said. Yeah. So what, do you think it's the movement that is helping the body the most or is it things that they have to step over or is it hilly at all? Yeah, we are on a slight slope. So I think that does help, but Honestly, I think the movement is obviously key. That's brilliant. They, I've planned it so they have hay at one end and, you know, they have to forage for their food. They snuffle like little pigs through the forest, you know. They, they're always looking for something and the water is then at another end. So they constantly have to do some form of movement. But I think also the being in a herd actually has a massive impact and I think it's something that we forget a little bit sometimes because although you know there's only three of them so it's a relatively small herd they naturally encourage each other to move and they move as a group if one wants a drink they all go for a drink I think it keeps their stress levels very low as well because I mean, they all three of them actually sleep all together. And I had always assumed and always seen that you would have one horse kind of keeping a lookout, but they will very often, all three of them will sleep at the same time, which is quite interesting. I don't know whether that's because they feel secure here. I mean, we are we are on the top of a hill. So again, they can see for quite a long way. And I think that also helps keep them calm because they can see, you know, danger from, you know, 20 miles away or whatever. Um, But it's also interesting. I mean, Buddy used to be, he was out on individual turnout when he was on a traditional barn livery yard type setup, but he'd always play a lot with the other horses. And now he plays, but it's not rough play. Like, you know how you see all these rugs getting ripped and that kind of thing? That doesn't happen anymore. They play and then they, you know, go off and do their own thing. But because they don't have to have this kind of intense moment of play because it's so short lived, they play a little bit more, it's less rough, they're far more settled. And I think they're also less bored because, I mean, particularly I watched the youngster, she's obviously a bit more active than the other two, but she'll go off and kind of do her own thing. And I've got trees that are like logs in the woods so they can jump over those if they want. And very often I'll see her can- cantering down to one end, just popping over the jump, turning around and then going, popping it over again and going off and playing with the others so yeah it's it's fascinating to watch them do their thing yeah that's so great I I that's my goal is to have a track system you know on a on a property someday and and even my clients that have put track systems in just seeing the horses move better I just feel like their whole body is just so much freer you know yeah yeah and I think even 
even stabling them for a short amount of time, I notice a difference. So when there's no wind here and it's hot, so we're expecting uh, really high temperatures over the next few days. And so they will come in during the day because the flies just get too much if there's no breeze. So, but even then I noticed that they don't move as well for a day or two when they've spent, you know, a few hours in. Um, they still move fine. It's not, but I just, I do notice a difference for sure. Yeah. And I'm sure that you notice even more because you've been trained to watch all their movement and their biomechanics and their body and, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. That's, those are a lot of the main points I wanted to hit, but you know, before we wrap up, do you have any advice, like general advice for owners um, in terms of rehabbing their horses? Um, I think the number one thing is understanding what your horse's normal is. I think a lot of people that I work with, particularly when, and I'm sure you see this as well, you know, when you're working with a rehab, it's actually quite scary sometimes that some of the owners have no idea what their horse's normal is and they don't understand how their horses move or where they hold elements of tension. And I think that's partly on us as professionals. You know, we need to be sharing that information with owners and saying, you know, t explaining to them why in a language that they understand why their horse is tight in some places and not in others and compensating for certain things. But also the owners, you know, we do have to take responsibility for our own horses and be accountable for that. So even just running your hands over your horse's body and feeling where, you know, muscles are tight and muscles aren't. And it is, it's, it's relatively easy. You don't have to be trained to understand that. The way I explain it to my owners is that a tight muscle or an area of tension will feel like you're running your fingers over the skin of a drum. So it feels, there's some give, but it feels tight. And it's different to running, you know, your hands on yourself. I think as humans, we tend to get knots rather than, you know, tight and locked on muscles but it's still the same you will feel that you know element of resistance um to when you're pushing down it won't just be soft and supple so that's my number one hint know what's normal yeah that's great I know I was even thinking I should be doing more of that myself um if anything I think this conversation has wanted me to explore body work more and and that leads me to actually one final question is how do you know if I mean, it's different in the States. We don't have to have any veterinarian overseeing body work. And it really, from what I know, it seems like most people could just say that they, you know, do equine massage and, and do it. Um, there's no governing oversight. Um, mm -hmm. So how do you know if the person that you're working with is going to be, you know, a good choice for your horse? Are there things to look for, certain questions to ask? Um. <laughs> That's a really, really good question. And um, so there are governing bodies, particularly in the UK and Europe, that we have to sign under. So I'm a member of the International Association of Animal Massage Therapists, if that's like not the longest um, <laughs> <laughs> organisation ever. Um, but there are a lot um, in the UK and in Europe. US, I don't know, I'm afraid. But in terms of what to be looking for, I think ask have a conversation with your therapist while they're working um i love talking to my owners and i love explaining to them what i'm feeling and why and i'll very often ask them questions of you know are you feeling a bit of a stiffness in the right rein or are you having trouble with your lateral work on this rein and they'll be like oh yes okay fine but you should also feel a difference in your horse after the treatment so i get all of my owners to ride pretty quickly or to work with their horses um pretty quickly after treatment unless I've had to do something particularly remedial um but nine times out of ten I want them to get on board so again they have that baseline then of how their horse should feel when they are totally supple and ready to go um and then they can move forward and then they can understand and kind of work with you on the treatment schedule but if you don't feel a difference or if you're I mean a lot of my um clients have come to me because I spend a lot of time hands-on so if someone likes to use a lot of devices um, and aren't actually getting their hands on your horse first that is a huge red flag for me because I I use tape I've got you know tools that I use as well to make sure that my hands don't die um, mm -hmm. but I will never 
ever, ever use those before I've put my hands on the horse first. Someone who has worked quite a bit with Krista and is going to be on call for consults with rehab horses at her facility is Stephen Lee. He is a hoof care provider in the UK that has spent a lot of time considering movement and making changes based on how the horse is loading its feet. He was also incredibly helpful throughout my own horse's rehab and answered my millions of questions patiently and thoughtfully. I wanted to ask him questions on rehabbing horses through movement as well. Yeah. And I know that you were super helpful when I was going through everything with my horse and trying to figure out what kept him the most comfortable. So but that sort of thing really, it just really helps to bounce stuff off people. Sometimes it's not obvious until you talk about it and then you kind of go down a path you didn't think you would. And, you know, I'm quite happy to pick the phone up with them and ask three or four different people and you'll, you'll generally get an answer somewhere from somebody to try. Yeah. And so do you trim based on, you know, are you watching them move and that movement is deciding how you're adjusting their feet or are you looking at their confirmation, their wear patterns? All and everything, to be honest, you sort of stand there from the minute you get out of the car, you're looking at the horse. From a say, point of view of a walk-up on a new horse, you, you've already spoken to the owner, you've got a rough idea of what they're thinking, but you can't make any judgment because you're only seeing through their eyes. So I kind of, you walk up, you look at the horse, when you're watching it move, you try to work out, is that a symptom or a cause? And then put your hands on the horse a little bit and just, just have a feel for tightness and then have another look at it move and... You kind of get a feel for it and any trimming is to basically what you think that if the horse is moving and working that's kind of where it would have worn to if that makes sense I, I never try and impose any shape on a horse that i don't think would be there if it wasn't wearing it itself yeah you're looking at how it moves and you sort of you get a feel of how that foot would be and you do as, as little as possible bearing in mind that a horse wearing its own foot calluses its foot as well so it's a stronger foot anyway than just taking a rasp to a foot you know you would do even less than you think the horse would have worn itself purely to give it that little bit extra foot there that it hadn't if it hadn't calloused it something i've become a bit intrigued with more and more is dynamic balance to explain dynamic balance i should probably contrast it with what many people are most familiar with which is static balance what does the horse's hooves and limb alignment look like when standing on a flat surface what do the rads show for hoof pastern alignment or palmar angle? This is what we consider when we're looking for static balance with them standing still. Something I feel is incredibly important during rehab and for keeping a horse sound is dynamic balance, meaning how are that horse's hooves and limbs landing and loading when in motion? Movement tells us a whole other side of the story and subtle changes in movement and body compensation can be seen well before a horse even really comes up as lame. Yeah. You know, I, I see a handful of horses that have, you know, pretty serious angular limb deformities or like, you know, they're really towed in or they're really towed yeah. out where if they were to just wear naturally, you know, a horse that I see that's really towed in would really only wear off that outside quarter of the foot, you know, and, and the outside toe pillar. And then just their inside would just grow and, and flare like crazy. Do you let them do that in those kind of instances? The answer is sometimes, not always. It's an easy get out, but that's the honest answer. Some horses, if you touch it, you'd make them lame. Other horses, if you don't touch it, they're going to have more of a problem, so it's going to tip them over. Generally, the one, if they're doing a lot of work and you've got them in a consistent work, you interfere less and less. It's getting them, it's the initial stages where the car, they're not physically fit enough or their feet aren't in the right place to do enough work to wear them into that plane and they're not on an abrasive or a a good conformable surface on a track or something like that. If they're just in a field and only managing half an hour every few days on just on tarmac, that's not going to be enough initially if, if you're dealing with a, an issue. But what you have to work out is why that's there, because that's always a symptom rather than the cause. That foot is loaded in a specific way that's allowing that foot, loading that foot dynamically to grow that way. So you need to know why that's happening, whether you can fix that or whether you have to just manage that. Yeah. And you kind of peel the onion skins back, you know, the longer it's had it, the more of the, you know, if, if you go and see a horse that's not been right for, I don't know, a couple of years, something like that, there'll be several things that your physio will find, you'll find, and actually it's finding out which ones are the symptom and which one's the actual root cause. And you only kind of get that from the stand watching them move and go with your gut feel, go what the physio says, what they're finding first and try little bits at a time and don't change too much in one go. Yeah. You know, physios are really good where they're, 
the best physio I find are the ones I find stuff but don't always release it. They'll, they'll look at something else first and think that might be compensation and you know, rather than just take everything away from the horse that actually might be using that as support, it could be a crutch that it actually needs. Right. I've got a real strong caveat is I'll not advise anybody how to trim a horse unless I'm stood in front of it. Right. If that makes sense. Purely because I'm looking at it through their eyes, I'm not looking at it through my own eyes. But there's an awful lot of stuff that you can talk about which can help a horse without actually telling someone how to trim their feet. You can see from movement what you would suggest, what would you try first just from looking at the video of the movement. Not necessarily trimming the feet, you know, have you looked at the back end, where you're at with diet-wise, have you looked at ulcers, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And so obviously much of what I do too is watching the movement and focusing on the dynamic balance and then getting a horse yeah. to land well and move well. Do you see, is it kind of a chicken and the egg thing of, is there issues in the body that cause hoof issues or are there hoof issues that cause body issues or is it both? It's both, but... The, the fact that the, the foot's the only thing in contact with the ground, you, you sort of take that as being the symptom first. I mean, they, they kind of, I tend to go back sort of analogy and things, but if you if you were taking your car into the garage and scrubbed the outside tyres off, you know, on the outside of the tyres were scrubbed off, you wouldn't just put a new set of tyres on and drive off. The guy would be saying to you, we need to check the geometry, the suspension, the tracking, or the suspension mounts or something like that first as to why these are scrubbed off. So you can look at it the same way with a horse. If, you, if your horse is wearing its feet in a certain way, you need to look as to why it's loading its feet that way. And the, everything's above the foot, so you need to look above the foot first. Yeah. So, you know, if somebody trims something and it comes back, it's coming back for a reason. And if you ignore it and just keep trimming it away, in my opinion, you're removing that horse's ability to compensate. If you manage along with it, you might never find out what's wrong with it because it won't go lame, if that makes sense. It's enough of a compensation for it to cope. But if you take it away, you'll find out. Nine times out of ten, you'll find out, which is not necessarily what you want in the long term. Yeah. And what kind of effects do you see on the feet from incorrect movement? Probably an easy example is, and I say I don't have any science behind this, just purely from sort of experience and seeing them. If you see a horse stood in front of you with almost symmetrical medial flares in front and lateral flares behind, the first thing I tell them is to have the back check x-rayed, and usually it's kissing spines or, or or a grade of that. If it's just the front with no flare behind, probably the saddle not sitting right, but they're just rules of thumb, and they're kind of on my list and my checklist. When I see that, that's the first thing I ask them to check. So seven times out of ten, you, you'll be something right. You might not, you know, it might say, oh, they were a bit tight here, or the saddle didn't fit. Usually if it looks like the saddle doesn't fit from the shape of the front feet, it doesn't fit. I think that's one of the beauties of not having a, a shoe on, if I'm honest. It allows the feet to change quite quickly, and you get to pick up on things before they're an issue. While it's compensating and able to compensate, you can fix the issue it's compensating for, which is sort of the benefit of why a lot of people ask me to go and look when they know they don't need the horse's feet trimmed but I'm still going out reasonably regularly just to see the horse, just to try and pick up on early issues from horses that have had issues in the past. People do value your opinion. That's what they're paying for, really. Or education. I, yeah, that, that, that's it. And, and the time and the their peace of mind that somebody else has looked at as well and you know, either agrees with them or suggests that they have a vet or they have a physio or, or something like that as well. And But one thing that I think that, I find so intriguing is how much movement can improve hoof quality and how underestimated it is in hoof rehab. Um, also, I think because a lot of times when a horse is lame, a lot of people will, will want to rest them, you know, <laughs> get them to stop moving to quote unquote heal. Uh, and, you know, can you talk a little bit about the changes that you see in moving on a track system like what Krista has and how it affects the feet? I just think movement in general is the best thing for horses. They're designed to move. They're not designed to stand. You know, mental health has a lot to do with horses doing well as well. So getting them out and getting them moving. And track systems seem to have, in the last sort of year and a half, two years, people have cottoned on that there is a real need for them. And, you know, a track system done well is, is fantastic. A track system done badly is still better than being stood in a 12-foot square stable. The foot is designed to work and move, and it's kind of use it or lose it. The more a horse is stood in, it's going to got, you know, you'll not see a horse stood in its own wee and whatever in a field. It'll wee and move off. In a stable, it's got to stand there, and that's where you start getting the frog issues and the, the thrush, and you're kind of fighting all the time where a horse out and moving in varied terrain is the, is the best, in my mind. It doesn't have to be rock hard all the time, like, you know, in the other areas. My horse is in a field, I don't use a track. My horse is in a field and, and in a big sort of concrete yard and barn. 
So there's a bedding and a barn. So they've got a sort of variety of services every day. And I think that's that's the key with regular work, if I'm honest. Yeah. And I always say to owners that, you know, sometimes I'll pick up a foot and say it looks like a foot that doesn't move. It's almost, you know, usually I see that they might be a little more, even if they're barefoot, they might be a little more contracted. Their frogs are weak. Yeah, I mean, you could probably show me 10 photographs and I'll probably be able to tell you the one out with that's not, not navicular, as you say, when you look at the back of the foot. You know, there's a standard thing, you know, most horses that I go to see when the, you know, inverted commas, navicular diagnosis, pain in the back of the foot, pretty much got thrust to one degree or another. Whether the thrush has caused them to land tool first, which has caused the issue behind, or whether it's they're not using the back of the foot that the thrush has started, you never really know. But most horses I see with navicular have thrust to some degree or other. And actually, talking a little bit about navicular rehab, why do you think that Krista's kind of approach, what she did with Buddy, why do you think that is so successful in so many navicular cases? You have to see Rockley to believe it as well, because obviously that's where Buddy went to start right. with. And the tracks there, when you, they're conformable, but they're just abrasive enough. That it's, I had not appreciated it until I went there and saw them. I think you've seen them as well. You know, yeah. The other thing that struck me is for, for the track and the movement to work there, there's the reason to move, different views and different reasons to be in different places. I think it's the it's the time for them to move, then the, the lead now gets them moving, then the ridden work and obviously the school work, the in hand, the gymnastic stuff that they, that they do is all about getting the horse to carry itself and get the parts of the body that's supposed to carry itself working properly again and allowing the foot to function. I mean, if you think of it from an engineering point of view, to allow the back of the foot to move is what the foot is designed to do and that's just the horse's suspension. So it's got to be more comfortable once the back of the foot strengthens up and starts to work the way it should. Once you start a land heel first, that's your key, really. It was something Nick sent me once, which kind of really stuck goats years ago, and it's always stayed in my head, is movement is key, but only good movement is what you want. You know, there's no point getting a toe first landed horse and then just working it and hoping it's going to come right. What you have to do is encourage it to land heel first first and then build the work up. The most comfortable thing for it to do, making sure there's no thrush, get it moving, you know, get it kind of wanting to move. And once it does that, from either physio or whatever, it's capable of where it's comfortable, it becomes happy to move again, and then you start to build the work up. And that's the hardest part, is trying to find out what you need to do for that particular horse to get that horse comfortable and landing correctly. Because I don't believe you'll ever fix a a navicular horse until you have it landing heel first. Right. Because all you're doing is compounding, you know, whatever issue. The way I kind of describe it to clients when I'm trying to explain it to them is if you think of the horse landing heel first, everything's pre-stressed under the foot, the toe's up, everything's already sort of tight, the horse lands on it, the back of the foot opens, the foot comes down, and then it breaks over and the step forward, a horse landing toe first, that's twanging tight. If you get a horse landing heel first, so everything's already loaded, ready to take the weight of the horse through this stride, through the articulation. Yeah, and so... Yeah. If you came to a client or, or a new horse that you hadn't met before, and, you know, I think a lot of us find this, you know, you see a horse with a weak foot and they're landing toe first, what do you usually start with? What's your approach? I'll stand and watch it first while I'm talking to them. I'll walk it up myself so I can see if there's something blatantly obvious, because some abnormalities you can see. What I'm looking for is a horse to land heel first and also both sides, medial lateral inside and outside of the foot to land at the same time. It's not rolling from inside to outside or outside to inside as it walks. If they're doing that, but then you look over the look down the back of the foot and they're deviated in from the fetlock, the foot can't be straight. So if the foot's straight, then you've got an issue. You can kind of say, well, actually, you need to leave this to grow out a little bit. Because if the leg's not straight, but you want the foot to land on the ground, then it can't be sort of straight to a T-square up its leg, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Usually, the frog health is the first thing I look at. Absolutely. You want them to land on something and they have to be land on something that's comfortable. And if they've got a sheared heel or they've just got pockets of thrush or something and the horse is not comfortable, the best wheel in the world is going to land toe first. You know, start with that and then you, you sort of pick back from that. Does it need a physio? Does it tweak something? You, you, every horse is different and you just go through this and you start with the easy things first, the easy wins. You know, if a horse has got thrush and it's stink in the back of its foot, you put the, like, the pick through the bottom just to have a feel of the bottom of the frog. And, you know, it comes out absolutely stinking, a black sludge. Start with that first before you do anything else, because anything you do, still, you're not going to be sure you fixed it until you know you've got a decent frog there. Right. And it's actually really good to get the owner buy in to, they want to fix the horse. I mean, just turn up every six, eight weeks or whatever, you know, trimming the horse is not, it's the it's what the owner does in between. That's the important things when they're rehabbing at home. So you've got to get them on board with what they need to do and give them a routine to do it. 
and you know a lot of people with a checklist when they know they'll start to see the improvement will stick to it religiously and that's where you see the improvements quicker and what kind of checklist do you give owners if their horse has a weak foot or or landing toe first or if they have thrush well fix the thrush i tend not to i mean i talk to them about diet but unless there's something horrendous like a pollen molasses on their feet or something like that I tend not to change anything to start with, because I don't like changing everything in one go. I'll have a look at their environment, whether on a livery yard, explain them about movement, the environment, the diet. But you have to work out what influence they can have over each part of that. If they're on full livery, can you change the feed? Can you, you know, if you turn up straight away and go through everything in one go, they just, you know, it, it's too much for people. What you're trying to do is explain how the horse should move so the client understands it. I video the horse, I slow it down, I've got an app on my phone, which is a coaching app for baseball or golf or something, which I slow that right down and just show them so they can see what I'm looking at and explain what I'm looking at. And then I ask them to take videos weekly just on an app on their iPhone and send them through if they want me to have a look and I can check for changes in the movement because they're walking them in exactly the same place as I've seen them walk before. So in my head, I can... I can see a change. There's no sense in me looking at one area and then them walking up somewhere else because the camber can be different and it's deceptive until you're actually stood there. You know, that things have got drainage cambers and things and that can make a horse look like it's land at the lateral edge and actually it's just the ground's not quite level. Where if you've been there and stood there yourself, you kind of know. Yeah. That's why I always get, it's kind of my pet here, people comment and stuff on the internet, you know, put a picture up in a, a video of my horse and you get a thousand people's comments on it and not one of them stood in front of the horse. That's the one downside of it after it drives me crackers. So the way I deal with that is to send me a video once a week and I'll have a look for them if they're worried. Yeah. And have you ever done something to the foot that resulted in a negative change in landing? Obviously, our our whole goal is to get the horse increasingly landing better. And as kind of a follow-up question to that that I was just thinking myself is, if there's a a portion that you know is really flared or if it seems really long but you don't know if the horse is using that to compensate for something else do you remove it i think touch wood i've been lucky i think if i was going to interfere with that i would be looking at the landing and if i landed on the first and roll and then that's a good reason to help them a bit and you do a little bit walk them up and have a look and then you'll do a little bit the next time rather than you're better off being a little bit wrong. It'll sort itself out. If you're a lot wrong, that's when they go sore. Yeah. If it's a, a horse that you've known for a long time, you've trimmed for a long time and you're seeing imbalance developing, that's the benefit of getting the physio involved. So you find out whether it's a symptom or a cause. If the horse is sound and you're seeing a change, you don't want to jump in and change that. And you need to find out why it's changing before you do anything. To me, it's counterintuitive to, to lame a sound horse. In case it might go lame later, if that makes sense. Yeah. Because you could risk it overloading other areas that compensate for what you've done. And actually, if you do that, it's probably the veterinary remit rather than a trimmer to be doing that. But, I mean, if you're turning up to a, a horse that's already lame, you, you basically, before you get there, you've probably done your due diligence. You've spoken to the owner. You need to know if it's seen a vet. And if it's seen the vet, have you talked to the vet? And then you need to know if the imbalance that you're thinking about taking away has been there before or if it's always been there. It might not even be that. It might be brewing an abscess or it might not even be in the hoof. And if you go and then trim something off, you're like muddying the waters for uh, any future lameness investigations that they're going to do in the next few weeks as well because they could then move differently and they don't really know where they're at. The way I say it, it's like risk and reward. If your horse is already sound, the risk outweighs the reward of, of trimming it off because you don't know it's going to go lame in the future. It's just what your perception is. If the horse is already lame and you've worked through everything else, then you do things slowly. So you're better off being a little bit wrong as a lot wrong. If you're trimming the horse all the time, it's got long toes. You want the toes back because biomechanically that's not ideal. So that's your job. But it's your job to get them back all the time the horse is comfortable. Because if you just whack it all off and the horse goes lame, you've actually caused something rather than fixed something. As trimmers, it's our responsibility to, you know, to have the best foot under the horse you can do. But if you think you need to change something, that horse must be comfortable all the time it's changing, or at least as comfortable as it was before. Otherwise, yeah, it, it's counterintuitive because we want everyone to say, well, look, that trimmer does really nice shaped feet. Isn't it really good? You look on the Instagram page or you look on the website and there's hundreds and hundreds of pictures of really nice feet. What I would want to see as an owner is lots of videos of horses sound after they've been trimmed and lots of comments from owners explaining how they got there that was what impressed me rather than hundreds of pictures anybody can sculpt a foot but the scale is doing what the horse needs rather than just make it what we want to look at anybody can sculpt stuff when my kids that make play-doh shapes anybody can do that that's a great picture but now let's say if the horse is crippled in the field or crippled walking back to the field i'm not impressed with that i'd rather see a foot turn up and the guys or the girls saying actually that foot's 
looks awful, but the horse is really sound. I think if I touch it today, it's going to be this, this, and this. What we need to do is get a physio in first, and I'll come back next week. And then I'd be impressed. If you're doing something to the horse, it should be sounder or at least the same. If it's worse off, then why are you doing it? It's for us, not for them. It's for an ego thing. It's not for the benefit of the horse. I love seeing a perfect foot, but I love seeing a sound horse an awful lot more. And the only balance that I care about, if I'm really honest, is dynamic balance. It was lame before it had this flair, but now it's sound. Well, let's leave that alone. If they're moving comfortably with an ugly foot, I'm happy with that. There's no substitute to stand in front of the horse and watching it actually move. Yeah. The foot is there to do a job. It's not a sculpture. It's not there to look at. We all love really pretty feet, but that's not what it's about. It's about the horse moving comfortably. If you trim it to make a pretty picture, you're going to compromise the performance, not optimize it. Right. Yeah. Which makes for, you know, maybe not a lot of great social media pictures, but at least you have a sound horse. So that's, that's what matters. Yeah. You know, that's so much of my philosophy too, but also it's such a, it's something that I feel I need just so much more experience in and I'm never quite there yet. You know, I always want to learn more. You'll never, you'll never get there. <laughs> if you get there, give up. The more you know, the more you know you don't know. You know, if you, as soon as you think you know it all, I think you're in the wrong job. Right. You, that's when you start to fail horses. That's when you stop thinking. That's when you stop looking for those extra answers and things. If it can't be fixed in your head, then it can't. You know, there's a million different things and you need to talk to people and keep thinking. I think one of my last questions is, do you have any advice for owners? Make sure you've got a team around you that you trust and make sure they're professionals that you can talk to. Some people are frightened to ask a question in case you offend somebody. Nobody should be doing anything to your horse that they can't explain to you. And if you don't understand... It's not your fault. You need to explain in a different way. If someone really understands something, really understands why they're doing something, they can explain it in a myriad of different ways. If you only explain it in one way, they've just read it somewhere and they're reading it back to you, if that makes sense. If they genuinely understand what they're doing, they'll be able to explain it in a different way till you understand. We all learn and understand different ways. So that's what I tell my clients. That's the first thing. Ask as many questions as you want and talk to me all the time I'm here because nobody should be putting a hand on your horse and doing something that they can't explain. If they don't know the answer, you can say, my good feel is this because that's okay. As long as they explain that, that's why they're, they're saying that. And just make sure that, they, you know, that everyone keeps talking. And make, you know, what I tend to do as well is that if I suggest a physio for a horse, I'll ring that physio directly after the owner's booked it. I'll say, you know, book whoever you're booking. Nine times out of ten, or eight times out of ten, I'll know who they are anyway. And give them a quick call and just spend 20 minutes with them and say, look, this is what I'm seeing. I'm thinking there's something around here. I don't know what it is. It's not my sort of remit. But could you let me know? I think it's loading this way, so I'm guessing it's coming from this hind or there's something sat really like or there's something that's tight in the shoulder and I don't know why. And then everyone's talking rather than get the owner to tell them what you've said because they get a bit of a Chinese whistle they miss something out or they're not quite explaining something properly. So I try and keep an open dialogue. Awesome. Thank you so much for talking to me. This is really great. No Lovely. <laughs> Lovely to see you. Yeah, you too. Have a great night. <laughs> Yeah, bye. Bye. I always say that I'm slightly more hoof obsessed than the average person. And chances are, if you're listening to a hoof care podcast, you are too. So we should probably be friends. Feel free to find me on Facebook or email me at thehumblehoof at gmail.com.